Nancy. I am from I'm a software developer at ThoughtWorks, and the talk I'm going to give today is called Daring to Pair. So it is a talk that's going to be about if you haven't already guessed pair programming, and basically I've been pairing ever since I started at ThoughtWorks, and I've been having a lot of thoughts about it, and I really wanted to just distill and articulate some of the insights I've gained around this. So this session is going to be half talk about some of the technical whys and hows of pair programming and also the biggest lessons I've learned from this whole journey of daring to pair and half demo where I, together with my colleague Amanda, uh, are going to show you guys some good and bad pairing in action. All right, so first the talk. I've been pair programming for five months now and it was difficult at first, right? It's, it's been tiring, frustrating, challenging. But as I've gotten better at it and more used to it, I do like it and I appreciate its effectiveness more and more. And I do believe that in many ways, uh, it has made me a better developer. And in many ways, it has made the teams I've worked with become better teams. So let's go back to the start of my pairing journey. I'm at ThoughtWorks training program for grads, we call, which we call ThoughtWorks University. Every day we have to pair with each other on coding dojos and projects. And you know, I'm nervous, I'm excited to learn, but I'm uncertain, right? This is a new thing for me. I'm used to working solo, working independently, and thinking my own head, not really talking to people much. And now I'm in this situation where I have to work really closely with this other person that I, I don't know all that well, and I have to learn to vocalize my thought processes and get used to having someone staring at my code as I type and be considerate to my partner and match their pace, be patient at explaining things. And I'm not used to it and it's, it's tiring. Right? I find myself getting impatient so many times. And sometimes I get the sense, you know, man, if I've been working on this task solo, I get it done so much more quickly. Other times I think, I can't think properly with someone constantly watching me as, as I code. I get self-conscious and anxious. And sometimes I just get annoyed when my partner just disagrees with me, right? But as the weeks go by, I'm starting to realize um, some things, and I start to get better. I go from being really unused to talking through my thoughts while coding to being able to do it quite naturally. I go from being anxious about being judged by my partner to being able to view them as what they really are, right? A partner who is here to collaborate with me, to solve problems, to bounce ideas off, to think things through with, and to share knowledge to catch each other when either of us slips up. So I go from being easily frustrated and impatient with a partner who is slower and less familiar with the code we are working on to bring them as a teammate that I have the responsibility of enabling and bringing along and I, help, I hone the patience in me to do so. So by the end of ThoughtWorks University, by the time I start on an actual project as a developer consultant on the client side, I'm realizing more and more the ways that pairing has helped me grow as a developer. And I don't have that much time, but I want to share some of the most important ones, in my opinion, with you today. Now, honestly, that's probably in tons of articles and blog posts and talks you know, about pair programming and its benefits and how it weighs up against solo programming. Uh, in fact, some thought workers from Germany put together this super awesome pair programming deck, which is like really one of the best pair programming one of ones I've ever seen. But I will not have time to do justice to all of it. I'm going to gloss over some really important points, right? Like how pairing really helps produce better quality code and saves time compared to traditional code review, and how it really keeps, helps to keep you focused on the task and um, allows you to work through tough problems better. But what I really want to bring across is one of the biggest realizations I've had about why pairing is so important. And so much of it, I realized, really just about teamwork and communication. Now, before I zoom out to the macro level of the team, I want to go back to the skills that I mentioned that pairing helped me as an individual improve upon. So, communication, right? Becoming a good explainer, something super important as a consultant, or even you know, if you're in a lead role, you're going to have to find yourself in a situation where you have to explain technical decisions to non-technical people sooner or later. And if you're not even able to do this with other technical people, that is your partner, it's, that's going to be a problem. And pairing really helps to train this skill. Realizing the importance of bringing my teammates along. Now, this is super and super important. And pairing was something that helped me realize how important this was. When I wrestled with the impatience of working with a partner, who was struggling more with the code than I was, I realized I was faced with two choices, right? I could be the jerk with the big, big ego and bridle in resentment and blame my partner for slowing me down, or I could gently guide my partner along, patiently explain to them the things that needed explaining, and watch them level up and grow their contribution towards the team in the long run. You can guess which one I chose. Getting to know my teammates better. This is so important for team camaraderie and just having a pleasant work environment in general. Right, you know those awkward moments where you're waiting for the test to run or where the, your project is just rebuilding? It's a perfect time to find out more about your colleague or just you know, talk about something silly and like, random. So in the project I'm on right now, like, I was pairing with this, this colleague one day and this, he randomly starts talking about his serendipitous discovery of this like, I don't know, half-naked gym in his neighborhood. And like, we started talking about all sorts of like, silly random stuff in the, in, the, in the interval. And so 
you know, you, you have fun, right? When you pairing is work, but you should also have fun with your partner. But let me ask a question. Right? Would these things matter if you were the only person working on a project? Or even if there was like, like only, only two of you working on a project? Probably not very much, not that much. But you know, let's face it, right? How, how likely or often is that ever going to happen? Just like one dev on a project. I guess like maybe in smaller companies like startups, it definitely can happen. But a lot of the times, you're going to be working in a team. And once you're working in a team, all these skills are super important for, to have as an individual. And pairing really helps to hone these skills. Now, zooming out from the individual level to look at the team as a whole, um, pair programming does so much to help in these three areas. Right? Knowledge sharing. I say this from personal experience, that this is a huge challenge when working in big teams. I work in a pretty big team right now. And as the team has grown, we've increasingly faced the problems of people losing context about different parts of the code base, or of silos of knowledge developing around just one or two people. And none of this is good, but pair programming with disciplined pair rotations, meaning switching up your partners every so often, really helps to alleviate this problem. And you know, of course, pair programming is not the only way of knowledge sharing. But you can have like, stuff like tech huddles, code reviews, and so on. But I will say this. As a truism almost, there is no better way to gain knowledge about a part of the code base than actually writing that piece of code yourself. And that is what pairing with frequent pair rotations gives you. So collective code ownership. Going back to the problem of silos of knowledge developing around just one or two people, it's never a good thing, right? You're going to meet a lot of problems with ego, where that rock star developer who has worked on one entire part of the code base on his own is going to be very resistant to change from other people in the team. And other teammates are not really going to dare to you know, try to change anything in that part of the code base because they don't know it well enough. And so eventually, before you know it, that, that part of the code base starts growing so complex and unknowable to the rest of the team that that rockstar developer just becomes like a single point of failure for your whole team. And this is the time for a fun anecdote. So um, I was talking to a business analyst on my team who has had a lot of experience working in like traditional enterprise environments. And there was one team which had this tech lead who was the only one who knew anything about this like very crucial part of the code base. And one day, the guy just disappeared. Like he literally vanished, ghosted, right? And he took all the context and even the code with him. And they literally had to get a police search warrant to go to the guy's apartment and retrieve his laptop and get the code so the team could continue working. So, so this is a pretty extreme case, right? But I hope you get the point that, you know, with pair programming, you avoid these kinds of knowledge silos, and you get the whole team to own the code. You don't shame any one person if some part of the code breaks or is poorly written, and likewise, you don't worship any one person who's architected an entire part of the code base on his own. Finally, onboarding new team members. Oh man, how grateful I am for this, because I had such a seamless onboarding onto my current project when I first joined, and it's really thanks to the patience of my teammates who pair with me and the, knowledge trans the ease of knowledge transfer you get when you're pair programming. And I was up to speed and contributing effectively in no time, and pairing helped immensely. I was learning new things and gaining context really quickly, and it definitely would not have been the same without pairing. So I've been talking a lot about the benefits of pairing, but I don't want to make it sound like a panacea for everything. Right? Pairing is just a tool. You have to use it in the right situations for it to be effective. So I'm going to briefly run through some situations where pairing may not be such a good idea. First, tedious rote work. Now, surely it does not make sense to pair on a fairly brainless task. But the caveat stolen from Martin Fowler is, if you are doing rote work, maybe you're missing a key abstraction somewhere. And maybe your pair can actually help you figure it out. You know, a different set of eyes to look at the problem in a different way and challenge your pre-existing assumptions. Then again, this is not always the case, I admit. Arguably, a lot of uh, UI work is, as long as you're sufficiently competent in it and don't need a partner to enable you, I agree, UI work involves a lot of unavoidable repetition, right? It's like just fiddling with padding, right? So in, in that case, I think <laughs> not pairing is pretty justifiable. <laughs> Next, when neither of the pair knows very much, well, there might be cases when you're both working in a stack that neither of you are very familiar with, in which case it does make sense, I think, to split up and do your own research, your own spiking, your own Googling, for trying things out, learning as you go. But I think it's still very beneficial to actually have a partner to come back together as with. And you know, once you've done your individual exploration, you come back together and share what you've learned. And it's also a way to keep each other accountable. right? You don't lose track of, of the task you're supposed to do. So you know, I put this as under like when not to pair. It's more like still have your partner, but you don't actually have to like actively be actively pairing, sharing a keyboard all the, all the time. Finally, when one of the pair is too green and fresh, so sometimes it can be hard 
uh, for a newbie programmer to get gain a sense of like independence and confidence if they start pairing from the get-go, right? So for newbies, it may actually be beneficial to go solo for a little bit or even to pair with another newbie programmer of about the same level so that you can kind of bang your heads together and help each other work things out rather than pairing with a senior who may end up like, you know, spoon feeding all the answers and undermining the independence that you get from like, actually banging your head against the problem. So with that, I want to share some of the hard lessons I've learned through my pair programming journey. Uh, some of you may think that this looks like I'm writing some kind of relationship guide, right? But yeah, actually, you know, seriously, it is kind of like that because pair programming is a very intense and personal act of collaboration. And I don't think it's much of a surprise that some of the same guidelines apply here. So, first of all, be self-aware. Where do you usually trip up? Keep that in mind and work on it. You ask your partner to keep an eye on those things when you pair and also, you know, be vulnerable. You have to open yourself up to your own flaws. You have to open yourself to acknowledging those flaws and accepting criticism from others about those flaws, right? Which brings me to ask for feedback. So you may be a self-aware person, but there will always be things that escape your detection. And the only way to find out is, is to consistently ask for feedback. And for things that you're, consistent, you're consciously trying to work on, a good way to find out if you're actually improving is to consistently ask for feedback from others. Don't let your ego get in the way. It's okay to look stupid and there's no need to show off. You know, if I compare how I onboarded onto my current project with how I got started on my project at my internship company, which some of you may know, there's quite a bit of difference. So when I got onto this project, because of the dynamics of pairing, um, because of how patient and kind my teammates were, I felt so comfortable looking stupid, asking all kinds of questions to improve my understanding of the project, and I was able to level up really fast. Um, thinking back to how I was as an intern, you know, I was really fearful of asking questions, and I did a lot of work very independently. And I had a mentor who was also very patient and kind, right? But I was both afraid of looking stupid and also afraid of like, distracting him from his real work that I hardly asked him any questions and did a lot of the work on my own. And he was like very happy with me, right? You did so much work. But when I like, think back to how I was, I, I really think that if I had been more willing to ask questions, I could have learned a lot more. So the dynamic of pair programming, that that, uh, which pair programming introduces, introduces into the team, really lowers this like, barrier of fear and uncertainty that a newcomer always feels. And existing devs are already so used to the idea of pairing and explaining their work to someone else that they don't see it as extra burden when a new person comes about. And they're good at it too because they're constantly forced to do it, right? So if you're a person in the pair who's less familiar with a bit, bit piece of code you're working on, don't be afraid to ask questions. Your pair should be more than happy to help. And conversely, if you are the person in the pair who's at the advantage, so to speak, there's no need to show off. You know, be patient. Don't put your partner down. When I was at Talks University, um, I typed pretty fast. And because I use Vim and I use it fairly fluently, I move around quite quickly, right? And a lot of times too quickly for some of my teammates to follow. And as childish as it sounds, I always like, felt this temptation to just move re really, really fast, even though I knew my partner couldn't keep up. And of course, sometimes I just end up doing unconsciously because I'm used to my own pace. But they almost always I'd be able to resist this because like, really, what's the point, right? How good a software product you're able to deliver doesn't depend on some amazing, your amazing Vim or Emacs skills or whatever. It really depends on how well your team works together. And unless you're going to actually spend time leveling up your team members to pick up those same amazing Vim and Emacs skills, you know, you just don't do that kind of thing. The kind of things really just inconsiderate to your partner. Don't let your ego get in your way. Next point, be humble. Yeah, this goes back to being self-aware and vulnerable. They, they're tied to each other, right? There's always something to learn and your partner will always have something to teach you, whether it's through them directly teaching you or you learning something through having to teach them. As I've grown in my humility, I've grown in my confidence too. They go together. Be flexible. So whenever you're working with someone other than yourself, you have to learn to make compromises. I'm sure you all know this. In ThoughtWorks University, we were working in Java with the IntelliJ IDE. Different people had different key maps. I figured I had to learn both. And on my current project, when I joined, most of the existing devs were using Visual Studio Code. You know, yeah, OK, big deal. I just had to learn a new tool. Right? And when you're pairing on someone else's machine, you make an effort to learn the way they work and the ID shortcuts or whatever. And so, like I said, I, I use Vim, and that's why I feel most effective using. And until now, I haven't paired with anyone who uses Vim. But you know, it's not a big deal, right? When I'm pairing on my machine, I just switch in and out of Vim mode. When I'm pairing on someone else's machine, I just forego it. I mean, everyone likes to work in, with what they're the most comfortable with. But if you can learn to be flexible and not grumble about why your partner doesn't use XSX tooling that you love or work in XXX way that you think is best, you'll be a better dev and person for it. Finally. You're responsible for making the session effective for yourself. To put it another way, you're responsible for 
being engaged, for working your partner in a mature manner, for not playing ego games, and for working on the things that you need to improve, improve upon. For example, and I come back to this again because it's been a consistent problem for me, but for example, I get impatient very easily when I feel my partner isn't getting things fast enough. And I could sit and stew in silent resentment for the whole session, yeah, being you know, dragged down by my partner and like, have a crappy pairing experience at the end of it. Or I could make the switch, you know, the mental switch, to go into like, enablement mode and you know, remind myself, you know, since I'm the one who has a better handle on this piece of code, I should be the partner and enable them, bring them along with me. And more, often, and more often than not, I'll actually realize something that I didn't realize before about the problem at hand, even if I'm the one doing the explaining. Right. And that choice and the resulting experience from that choice is your responsibility. So on the other hand, obviously I've been in a lot of situations where I'm the more ex inexperienced side of the pair. And if my partner is moving too fast and not explaining things enough, it's up to me to sound this out right? and get my partner to slow down and re-explain the parts that trip me up. Because if you struggle in silence, your partner may just like solder ahead thinking that everything is fine. And then you just end up sitting and stewing in silent resentment and fear. And again, the choice to speak up and the resulting experience from that choice is your responsibility. Okay, with that, I think I've spent enough time talking about the benefits of pairing and my own personal challenges. So at this point, if you have not done pairing before, you are probably wondering, how do you do it? Show me how do you do it? Okay, so it is demo time. I would like to welcome my colleague Amanda to help me out with this. Yeah. You use VS Code. Huh? VS yeah. Code. Sorry, this thing is. I actually never used it before. It's okay. It's, it's well, it doesn't really matter. Oh, I need to close this. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, should I prepare this more? Uh, can you run the terminal from VS Code? Can yes, you? yes. You're always intelligent, is it? <coughs> no, I use Atom and then I just. Oh, you don't yeah. use Ali. we're going to walk you guys through is to program a calculator that can calculate a mean and a sum. I am, so we're going to do this in two parts. The first part will be anti-patterns, of pa pairing anti-patterns. Is it too, can you guys see? Let's close it. Yeah. It's been on off. It's on. Okay. So, Amanda, we are going to be pairing on this task. Um, yeah, so I'm going to implement this calculator that implements sum. It's going to take a list of numbers and find the sum of it. Right, let's do TDD, okay? Test okay, first. Let's start. Okay, let's so look at this damn cute cat gif. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um so okay, this this method should take in a list of yeah, numbers, yeah, sounds right? Sounds good, sounds good. Um okay, let me check let me this out. Yeah, looks looks good, looks good. <laughs> okay, so I think I my first ex my first uh, expect my first test should be something like maybe if I pass in what happens if I pass in an empty array? What's the sum of an em empty array? I don't know. Hey, this is quite interesting. Okay, that's, that's it for the first anti-pattern. So, you know, it's, it's really annoying if you're pairing and your partner is like constantly looking at their phone and like talking about cat gifs and half-naked gyms and, you know, so... <laughs> yeah, so be considerate to your partner. Like maybe sometimes you have an urgent message and take the call, just let them know. Um, but you know, just don't. You know, it's not just about pairing, right? Even when you're having lunch and dinner with people, it's quite annoying if someone always takes out their phone and looks at it. So, second anti-pattern. Okay, are you ready to pair on this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm thinking like if 
when it should uh, return zero when the when you get an empty array or should it be like you know no, of course not it should just return zero if it's empty what are you talking about yeah like let me do it <laughs> <laughs> return i think throw error better like, yeah you really don't know eh, seriously. <laughs> uh, um uh, why why do you think we should throw an error i mean like i mean of know. course uh, i mean you don't usually <laughs> okay, so that's the second anti pattern. <laughs> Basically, don't be a jerk. <laughs> don't snatch your partner's keyboard halfway. And, you know, don't like dismiss, put them down all the time. Okay, are you ready to pair now? <laughs> yeah. No. Let me try again. Okay, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna say that it should return zero, okay? Because if you have empty array, well, the sum is zero, right? Um, so I'm going to expect calculator <coughs> dot sum empty array. <coughs> okay. Um, and yeah, oh, we're not Sorry. doing, are you doing oh, that? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, let's try implementing that. Implement this? Yeah. Okay. So first you need a um a method, right? You define yes. the sum. So I need a static method sum. Yep. And then it's gonna you take need to take in like a list of numbers, right? Mm. So then the easiest way to make it pass is to return zero. <laughs> Baby steps. So we are doing driver navigator now. Yep. So this is a style of pairing yeah. where one person primarily types yeah. and the other person kind of has a more strategic mindset and guides the driver along and like tries to think of edge cases or you know abstractions. So I'm gonna run this test. Oh sorry. Oh sorry, I'm using Yarn for this. I don't know why I'm using Yarn. Did I type? NPM test. Eh? Look at your package, Jason. Oh, wait, this is. Yeah. NPM test. Yeah. NPM test. Yeah. It's still. Oh, you need NPM I. No, okay, because I was using Yan. Hold on. Oh. oh, is it? Sorry. Wow, what? I cannot trust this. Standard programming kickoff. It's okay, pair. <laughs> <laughs> encourage your pair, man. Encourage, what's our encouragement? It's okay. We'll figure this out together. <laughs> Aww. Aww. <laughs> Hold on. I, I ran NPM and it was fine. Eh? Oh, you ran. Yeah, it's just NPM I and then NPM test. Okay, because I was using Yarn before, then. Oh, it's my my brain up. back up. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Maybe we can move on. To okay, let's uh continue writing this first. Yeah, but that definitely passed. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trust. <laughs> trust me. Okay, so um, let's write the next test. Okay, so um, I think maybe we can make it a bit more complex. So we can pass in a list of numbers. Maybe we can define just one, two, three, four, five, and see. Okay. So one, two, so one, so one, one two, one, three, two, and just sum of six. Can okay. Count, yeah, should return like six. <laughs> if it should return the sum. It should, yeah. So. Maybe I'll just pull it out so that we can modify it easily. Yeah. Yeah. This is, by the way, um, another good way, key thing about pairing successfully is to have a proper setup. This is obviously not the proper setup. <laughs> You're going to get neck pain doing this, but for the sake of demonstration purposes.
So like ideally you would have a pairing monitor and a pairing a keyboard for your pair. Two sets of keyboards. Yep, and two sets of monitors preferably. Okay. Okay, let me Let's run see if that passed. Yeah, let me see if my tests are running now. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, it should be test. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yay! Passes! Well, it shouldn't fail. <laughs> so one test passed and the other test failed, as expected, I guess. Yeah, let's try implementing that. So, um, so you have an array of numbers. Can you sum them? You can try using reduce. Reduce, right? Yeah. So we're going to take a function that yeah, takes so a... so the first one should be an accumulator. accumulator. And then the next one and the an element. element. And then you plus, you sum them together. That should. And then my initial value should be well. It doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. Well, but what if our num? Okay, yeah, let's let's try this. For empty, let's try this. Oh. Yeah, the first but the first one. Yeah, because you didn't check for empty. So oh no! I wait, I didn't. Sorry, no. This is a. So this this. Like if if you can do it. If. Oh. Wait, no, this one is a different error. So my second test failed because I didn't return anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Damn it. Sorry, it's not coffee script. Empty pattern tree, no hackers. Yep, so the first, the first uh, test failed because we are passing an empty array, right? Yeah. So if you want it to be zero, we have to pass in an initial value. Awesome. So red, green. Let's Ooh. refactor, maybe. Yay! You want to do the refactoring? Um. Then I thought ping pong. Okay. Now let's. For sake of time, let's move on to uh, demoing the other style of um, pairing, which is ping pong. So this is a style where you write. You, you, it's for TDD. So you write a test, and then you, and you watch them fail. Random make sure they fail, and then how much time do you have? Um. Time is up. Okay, sure. Oh. oh, okay. Well, too bad. We can't show you ping pong. But there is a ping pong table. <laughs> <laughs> you can live with that. Okay, thank you, folks. Uh, hope you learned something about pairing today.